Good morning, church. We want to welcome to you to another online worship session. I just want to thank you so much for always signing on to our Zoom or our YouTube uh, streams these past few weeks and just worshiping with us. It's almost been about half a year since this whole thing started, and we just want to thank you so much for your perseverance in joining us uh, every Sunday to worship. Uh, let's continue to run the race together and sing songs to our God. never fails me all my days I've been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up till I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God my life you have been faithful and all my life you have been so so good with every breath that I am able I will sing the goodness of God
God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Father God, we just thank you for this time that we have to worship you today. Um, even though we are still, you know, seeing each other through the screen, um, God, I just pray that you are you make your presence known to us, um, even in these moments, and that even in moments of uncertainty, when we don't know what the rest of the year is going to look like or what that might bring, but God, I just pray that we hold on to you and we cling to you as our vision and our hope um, and our solid rock that never fails, Lord, and I just pray that you allow us to be able to continue to grow in community um, and and really push each other forward in that, in that way, and we just thank you once again, in Christ's name I pray, amen. Good morning, everyone. So nice to see you all uh, worshiping with us this morning. We're so glad you're here worshiping with us. Uh, we're glad you're here. We want to welcome you this morning. It's awesome. And I hope that you're enjoying your worship experience so far. Uh, feel free to hit us uh, with like, share, and subscribe once again. We also have people on live chat or uh, on Zoom, uh, which is uh, on, on your computer, you can access that and we are ready to answer any questions that you may have. And today we'll be closing out our sermon series on community. As a refresher, we've been looking at different passages on what it means to be in community, what a community look like or uh, how we're supposed to grow together. And today uh, we're going to close out our series by uh, looking at the topic of honoring one another together from Romans chapter uh, chapter 12 verses 9 to 21. If you have your Bible, uh, let's let's open to it. Uh, chapter 12 verses 9 to 21. It says, love must be sincere, hate what is evil, cling to what is good, be devoted to one another in love, honor one another above yourselves, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord, be joyful in hope, patience in affliction, faithful in prayer, share with the Lord's people who are in need, practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn, live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing so, or in doing this, you will, heap, uh, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. God, we thank you for this day. We just want to uh, commit our time to you as we uh, study your word this morning. God, may you bless us uh, with insight, with understanding. Uh, God, may you uh, bless our time together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I just want to point out that uh, the section right before the passage we just read, Paul urges uh, the Christians in Rome to present their bodies as a living sacrifice or as a spiritual act of worship to God. He admonishes them, uh, do not conform to the uh, pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your minds. 
That's what he says earlier in this chapter. A lot of you guys are familiar with those verses. Uh, in this section of Romans, we get a very clear sense of what Paul's concern for the image of the church towards the outside world. He is seriously concerned with the witness of the church. In other words, he has concerns about how they are living their lives, especially how they are living before the people outside the church. Paul's greatest burden since his, since his conversion was the salvation of Israel. If Jews were going to accept Jesus Christ as the Messiah and the Son of God, his followers would have to give testimony uh, in their life, uh, in their daily lives, that Jesus Christ is Lord. Paul uses the image of the body, a living and dynamic organism, to describe the church in this chapter. In the beginning of this chapter, there can only be harmony when there is sincere love, caring, and compassion among the members. Sincere and unconditional love among the members were to, to be the determining factors for the successful witness of the church. This all seems so simple. And yet, church throughout the ages has struggled with this being a faithful witness to Jesus Christ. And I believe that Paul was onto something here when he condemned the pattern of the world and urged a renewal of the heart and mind. What is the pattern of this world? Well, when we look at our culture and also our own lives, we, um, what we see is that it is our indifference toward each other and toward our God. Our culture is quite good at confusing and negotiating the issue that for us Christians should be non-negotiable. What used to be good or evil is now not so bad or not so good, depending on how the issue affects you. And as a result, Christian standards are becoming very hard to distinguish from worldly standards. Even so, uh, or even worse, Moral absolute seems like it doesn't even exist anymore. But nonetheless, the Apostle Paul here is calling us to be different. He is giving us a list of things based on love, practical things that we can measure ourselves with in, re with in regards to living our lives. He encourages us to let this uh, love overflow from the church to the outside world. And he starts off uh, with, uh, with uh, verse 9. Love must be sincere. It says love must be sincere. Um, I would say love is one of the most common yet misused and misunderstand words in the English language. For example, I can say I love my wife, but I also love basketball. I love my kids, but I also love eating at Chipotle. Um, those can't be possibly uh, the same emotions, but yet we use the same word each time. How can that be, right? The only way something like that would even make sense or be possible is if uh, there are multiple definitions of the word love. You see, in the English, or in English, we only have one word, love. But in Greek, the language of the New Testament, there are actually four different words that are all translated as love. And I've shared this in the past, so let me go over this uh, quickly. The first word is storge. This Greek word describes family love, the affection bond that develops naturally between parents and children and brothers and sisters. Many examples of uh, the storge love are found in scriptures such as um, the love of Jacob for his sons or uh, the, the strong love the sisters uh, Mary and Martha had for their brother Lazarus. And then the second word is phileo. Phileo, this word describes the powerful emotion bond between friendships. And uh, phileo is the most general type of love in scripture, encompassing love for one another, care, respect, compassion for people in need. Uh, phileo, uh, it's actually where we get the word uh, Philadelphia, the city, the name of the city. Uh, this city is named after this Greek word. Uh, that's why it's called the city of brotherly love. 
One of the example of phileo love or in scripture would be David and Jonathan. Uh, the third word is eros. Eros is the Greek word for romantic love. The word is used to describe sexual desire, physical attraction, and physical love. And uh, an example of this would be uh, Samson uh, in the book of Judges who eros Delilah. And the last one is agape. Agape is the highest form of the four types of love in the Bible. This term uh, defines God's immeasurable, incomparable love for humankind. And it is uh, the divine love that comes from God. Agape love is perfect, unconditional, and sacrificial. And the word being used here in Romans chapter 12, verse 9, is agape love. Agape must be sincere or genuine. That's what it says here. The Greek word for sincere means without hypocrisy or undisguised. Uh, what would love actually look like if it was hypocritical? And, you know, think about the negative stuff, right? I think it would be very showy at the, at the, it would be at, at the forefront. It would be uh, driven by pride and uh, very self-centered uh, kind of love. On the contrary, genuine love is a love without hypocrisy. This genuine love is the motivation for us to serve. We are called to love one another, uh, love other believers in the local church. It, um, it is a, a love that is free from selfish agendas. Uh, we love and serve one another with an attitude of wanting the best for others and not to see what we can get from other people. And then here Paul goes on, he says, hate what is evil, cling to what is good, be devoted to one another in love, honor one another above yourselves, never be lacking in zeal, but keeping your spiritual fervor, uh, serving the Lord, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer, share with the Lord's people who are in need, practice hospitality. This part of the passage really is all about uh, the, the, it's all about genuine love in action to the family of God. Verses 10 to 13, he said, be devoted to one another. Um, this is a command that Christians should not have a cold, standoffish attitude. In fact, we need to do it to one another in love. That's what he's saying. And this time, the word love here is phileo, which means brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves, he said. We should see this as much as anything, a call to uh, simple, good manners among Christians. And thanks to God, uh, Paul here, he spells out for us the, the specifics uh, of what this love actually looks like. First, in honoring one another above yourselves, which means we are to consider our brothers and sisters in Christ to be more worthy than ourselves. And then in verse 11, never be lacking in zeal, which means we are not to be lazy in our duties to one another. And then he said, fervent in spirit or in prayer, which literally means to have spirits uh, which are boiling over. This happens when we are inflamed by the Holy Spirit. And then serving the Lord means uh, we are to be in submission to the Lordship of Christ. And then in verse 12, rejoicing in hope, patient in affliction, or patient in tribulation, depending on the translation you have, meaning that when persecuted, we are to endure, not passively, not passively, but actively to persevere. Then he said, continuing, uh, continuing in prayer carries the idea of urgencies and steadfastness uh, in prayer. In verse 13, he said, share with the Lord's people who are in need. Uh, uses the verb form of the word koinonia, which is, uh, it means fellowshipping with one another. Uh, sharing in each other's need. And then lastly, practice hospitality, which involves uh, sharing uh, your, your home or resources. And this is really a list that Apostle Paul gave us, and this is what love looks like within the church. This is genuine love 
in action to the family of God. Then Paul moves on to the next point, genuine love in action to humanity in general. Uh, verses 14 to 16 Let's read that together, verses 6, 14 to 16. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice uh, with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with the people of low position. Do not be conceited. You see, our natural response to someone who has hurt us or cursed us uh, persecuted us uh, is to get even by doing the same thing to them. Uh, I'm, you might think I'm, I'm going to show them how it feels to be treated the way they treated me. But we follow our Lord Jesus Christ, who when persecuted, treated badly, beaten, and even murdered, did not seek to get even, but prayed. Look at Luke chapter 23, verse 34. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. Again, we are called to be different. We are not to have a hateful attitude towards anyone, not even towards those who persecute us. You see, Jesus spoke of this same heart in Matthew chapter 5, verse 46. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? So in other words, we have to bite our tongue and be like Jesus. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. And then in verse 15, and then in verse 15, it says, Rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn. Uh, this is how we can fulfill the command to, to live in harmony with one another. It is a simple command to be considerate uh, of, the, of the feelings of other people instead of waiting for them to be considerate of our own feelings, right? Um, you know what? Let me elaborate a, a little bit more. You know, weeping with our friends and loved ones when they weep is natural, right? But weeping with our enemy uh, when they are weeping is unnatural, to be honest with you, and requires a godly perspective and power. You know, watching enemies prosper and being successful uh, can be very difficult, right? It could be a co-worker you don't really like to begin with and he gets a promotion and you didn't or what if they are um, what if you know somebody you don't like they have good health they're enjoying good health and you don't have good health what about somebody who uh, buy a new house or get married or uh, have a baby and you are still waiting for all these things to to be happened uh, in your lives you see why it can be so hard to rejoice with those who rejoice and why we need God's love to help us do that. Paul goes on saying, do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low positions. Do not be conceited. Here Paul reminds us that God loves and values everyone. We must never see ourselves as above or beyond anyone. We can't think too highly of ourselves. We got to remember that the ground is level at the foot of the cross. God loves you as much as he loves the person who lives next to you or live next door to you. God loves you as much as uh, he loves the jerk who works in your office. God loves you as much as the person who, who's standing by the traffic lights begging for food. So don't be conceited. Bless everyone around you, especially those who don't know Jesus Christ. Paul then closes out this section with this last point. Genuine love in action to an enemy. Verses 17 to 21. This is where really the rubber meets the road. 
This proves whether or not your love is genuine. It is easy to pretend, right? To love when everyone loves you. <clears throat> But what about when someone hates you and persecutes you? It says in verse 17, Do not repay anyone for evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. The right attitude and the right strategy for overcoming evil with good and to not answer evil with evil is to realize that God will get even for you. We don't have to get even with someone who has wronged us. We can trust in our God, uh, in our God who knows all things if there is any vengeance to take place by faith, we can wait for God to do it for us. We trust, we have faith that revenge will happen correctly and appropriately when God does it and not us. Because God knows all things and He knows exactly what is right in any given situation. It probably won't happen on our time schedule, but it will happen. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 35, it says, It is mine to avenge, I will repay. In due time their foot will slip, their day of disaster is near, and their doom rushes upon them. Brothers and sisters, it takes faith to not avenge yourself. It takes discipline to not have the last word or to seek to get revenge. Because we have genuine love, we can say, wait, you know, wait a minute. I can let this one go because I trust that God will take care of this matter. In His timing, it will be done in perfection. Because I trust God, I can actually show, uh, show other people kindness or show them kindness. You know, Paul wrapped up this section with an appropriate bottom line which is the last verse do not overcome by evil but overcome evil with good what this is saying is that we must constantly remind ourselves guard against the tendency to conform our behavior to this world and the tendency to want to battle evil with evil we will never overcome or conquer evil using evil but We can overcome and conquer evil with good. That's what Apostle Paul is saying. The greatest example in history of someone overcoming evil with good is what our Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, did on the cross. Just think of all the, all the things that happened to him, the injustice, the mistreatment. Jesus suffered throughout his ministry, his trial and conviction, uh, conviction and throughout uh, his crucifixion. But as Jesus hung on the cross, his prayer for his persecutors and tormentors was, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. When the apostle Peter looked back at what Jesus had to endure, he wrote in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 23, when they heard uh, their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. How's that for an example for us to follow when you think about that? You know, let me close with this. We have looked at various um, aspects of genuine love today. And I want to close with this thought. You know, in 1 uh, Corinthians chapter 12, Paul speaks about a body consisting uh, of many parts with different functions. In When I think about that, we, 
I think we we must be there to offer uh, support to one another if we truly love one another. So I wonder, right? I wonder how well do I know my body? At the same time, how well do you know your body? How well uh, do you and I take care of each other? Do we know each other's emotional and spiritual pains as well as the physical pains? Do we cry with the brothers and sisters in distress? Do we laugh and celebrate with each other in our mountaintop experiences? How do we flourish as the body of Christ here at FCBC Dallas? And what exercise routine do we need to follow to get ourselves back in shape? You know, I think it would include some of the things that Paul sp speaks about here in Romans 12. Sincere love, uh, an attitude of belonging to Jesus Christ and to each other in the body of Christ. Mutual submission and accountability. Trust in the righteous judgment of God when someone has done us wrong and a sincere desire to be a part of each other's lives. You know, Jesus said, by this, the world will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So may the signs of our love for God be visible to the world by the way in which we love one another by the way we live our lives, according to this Romans chapter 12. Would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we praise you for who you are. God, we thank you so much for your word this morning. God, may you continue to work in our lives. Help us to practice this genuine love that you have placed before us. Help us to see uh, our shortcomings. God, may your spirit lead us and guide us, help us to um, make adjustments in our lives so that we would even love, we would love each other even more. God, thank you so much for blessing us this morning. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forever. Amen. Thank you for joining us this morning again. God bless you. Have a great week. Uh, see you next week. Bye-bye.